So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nanuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Policies can either make or break a country and its people. Hence, they should be thoroughly studied and evaluated. This is where policy research comes in. Through Malacanang Proclamation 247 in 2002, the government declared the month of September as Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM. The DPRM aims to promote nationwide awareness on the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policies, plans, and programs. It also aims to cultivate a strong culture of research and research use among decision makers and raise the public's literacy on socioeconomic issues. The proclamation also designated the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, to oversee and coordinate all activities related to the DPRM. Various activities such as policy forums, press conferences, social media promotion, and the annual public policy conference are organized by PIDS and its partners to celebrate the DPRM. Every year, the DPRM focuses on a particular theme, 
which is usually a current or an emerging development issue of national significance. For instance, the DPRM has centered on issues pertaining to regulations, risk reduction and management, decentralization, the fourth industrial revolution, and the new globalization. This year, in response to what is happening globally and locally, the DPRM is focusing on the theme, Bouncing Back Together, Innovating Governance for the New Normal. Through this theme, we hope to help in channeling our collective resolve as a nation toward moving forward from the adverse impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. For us to bounce back from this crisis, we must innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward the path of renewed growth and dynamism. A whole-of-society approach is crucial, with the government taking the lead and engaging all stakeholders, including the private sector, academia, civil society, and local communities, to innovate and reconfigure their strategies, structures, and processes. To adapt to the new normal, which entails a new way of working, learning, and interacting with one another, public and private sectors need to invest in digital education, e-commerce, e-finance, e-health, and other innovative ways of delivering services. At the same time, the government should ramp up its social protection system to assist the most vulnerable sectors seriously affected by increasing unemployment and loss of income. As individual citizens, we also have a role to play in helping the country bounce back in the new normal. We should be innovative, adaptive, and agile in the face of adversity and change. By shifting to a new brand of governance that is agile and innovative, we can beat this crisis. Visit the DPRM website for more information. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies Annual Public Policy Conference on Innovating Governance for the New Normal. I am Justine Siket, a research fellow at the PIDS, and I will be your, host, your moderator for today. Um, we will start at exactly 9 a.m., so if you could please take note of the house rules that are flashed on the screen, and I will see you at 9 a.m. Thank you.
Okay, so hello again. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second of four webinars of the sixth annual public policy conference themed this year as Innovating Governance for the New Normal. I am Justine Siket, a research fellow at the PIDS, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin, I would like to uh, brief you about the house rules. For attendees, your microphones are muted upon entry. In case you have a question, I will read it during the open forum. To ask a question for the open forum, participants joining us through WebEx should use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name, affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. Again, please send to all panelists. You may do so while the presentations are in progress. I will read the questions during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comments section will be read by myself during the open forum. We will moderate all the questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Now today's webinar entitled Institutional Innovations and Reforms Under the New Normal um, focus primarily on the need to innovate institutions that are the foundation for governance. What are institutions? In New Institutional Economics, Nobel Prize winning economists Douglas North and Oliver Williamson define institutions as the rules of the game, such as laws, mandates, regulations, procedures, and guidelines that affect governance, which is the play of the game. One of the main ideas central to this webinar is that information should be viewed as an institution, whether because it is an input or outcome of the public education system or of upskilling the workforce, or as an input to improve public service delivery, such as integrated information systems for the vulnerable in society. All this requires either fully implementing existing laws or innovating and enabling complementary laws, regulations, guidelines to allow information to become an institution one that is systematically gathered, safely stored, and safely shared across national government agencies. For agile and innovative governance in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. The goal of the webinar today is to come up with a set of specific recommendations for institutional and policy plans or actions aimed at innovating governance and in promoting innovation to the public sector towards recovery and resilience. Now, to formally open our webinar, I would like to call on our president, Dr. Celia M. Reyes. Dr. Reyes, please. Thank you, um, Justine, and good morning to everyone. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following um, to our speakers. Um, we're very pleased that we have with us Korean Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management Professor Juho Lee. Um, Center for International Governance Innovation Senior Fellow Sean McDonald, National Privacy Commissioner, uh, National Privacy Commission Commissioner and Chairman Raymond Liboro, Aten Ateneo School of Government Dean and Professor Ronald Mendoza, Licini Law Office Senior Associate Attorney Aiken Larisa Cerzo, and uh, of course our PIDS Research Fellow um, Justine Sikat. And from the government, we have DBM Undersecretary Laura Pasqua, and from NEDA, Assistant Secretary Roderick Planta, Assistant Secretary Greg Pineda, and our regional directors. Uh, from the ILG, we have Assistant Secretary for Plans and Programs, Francisco Cruz. Um, this morning, we have Philippine Consulate General in Hong Kong, Consul Maria Sheila Monedero and Ernesto, um, GSIS Senior Vice President Raquel de Guzman Buenzalida, PGC Senior Vice President Ian Briones, and uh, Senate Economic Planning Office Director General um, Ronald Golding, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department um, Deputy Executive Director Ronjan Bronce, and we have officials and representatives from the Department of Foreign Affairs, Department of Budget and Management, Department of Finance, Department of Information and Communications Technology, Department of Social Welfare and Development, National Food Authority, National Council on Disability Affairs, Department of Education, Department of Science and Technology, Department of Labor and Employment, Tariff Commission, Securities and Exchange Commission, 
Intellectual Property Office of the Philippines, Agricultural Credit Policy Council, Public Private Partnership Center, and to all colleagues in national government. We're also joined today by officials uh, from some of our local government units and from the academe. We have SLSU President um, Dora C. Zoleta Nantes and its officials, USC President Lassie Sosalian, Dansalan College um, Foundation President Fidelinda Tawagon, and from Agusan del Sur State College of Agriculture and Technology, we have President Joy Capistrano, UP Executive Vice President Teodoro Urbosa, um, UPLB Graduate School Dean Jose Camacho Jr. We have uh, UP College of Fine Arts Dean Mitzi Marie Reyes, University of Southeastern Philippines Dean Rec Eguia, Pamantasan ng Muzod ng Manila Dean Luz Viminda Gabor, um, CNU Director Lawrence Garcia, UPLB Institute for Governance and Rural Development Director Jane Reyes, um, Manuel and Verga University Foundation. Lucena Director Maria Isabel Granada, PUP Director Ferdinand La Puebla, and National Telehealth Center Director Raymond Francis Sarmiento. And of course, we have with us our PIDS Board of Trustee, Dr. Gilbert Yanto, and Board Advisor, Dr. Alfredo Pascual. And from CSOs and International Organization, we're joined this morning by Embassy of Canada Ambassador Peter MacArthur, Embassy of the Republic of Indonesia Second Secretary Francisca Susanto, Unido, Unido Country Representative Tony Lin Lim, Water and Life Philippines Country Director Alexia Michaels. So we also want to acknowledge all those who are in WebEx as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good morning and welcome to the second of the four-part webinar series of this year's annual Public Policy Conference or APPC. The APPC is the main and culminating activity of the Development Policy Research Month celebration held every September. It's anchored on the DPRM 2020 theme, Bouncing Back Together, Innovating Governance for the New Normal. Last Tuesday's webinar talked about key reforms that government should pursue to be able to deal with current challenges and prepare for similar risk in the future. This morning, we will be discussing about institutional innovations and reforms under the new normal. Particularly, we will look into the current institutional issues that warrants immediate action to achieve an agile and innovative governance in the midst of a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. In the Philippines, the pandemic has unveiled weaknesses in our governance systems and structures. We saw the lack of accurate information on beneficiaries as well as poor coordination across different levels of government. And this have caused the delay of uh, delivery of some government services, especially to those who are mostly affected by the outbreak. While the government has come up with some solutions to address these challenges, these are areas that we can work on to build a more resilient economy. The government needs to institute innovative ways to be able to respond swiftly to the needs of the people. Other countries have encountered some of these problems too, and their actions have yielded positive results. Thus, we would like to understand and learn from their examples. Today, we have with us international and local experts who will help us understand better these institutional issues and the reforms that are needed to mitigate the adverse effects of the pandemic. Our moderator will introduce them shortly. I'd like to express my deepest appreciation to all our speakers and panelists for accepting our invitation to be part of this webinar. Let me also take this opportunity to invite you to the rest of the APPC webinars on governance innovations next week. The third webinar, which will be on September 22, will feature presentations on strengthening the civil service under the new normal. The fourth and last webinar on September 24 will revolve around the topic, Smart Systems for Agile Governance under the New Normal. Before I give the floor to the moderator, let's watch this video, which sums up the message of this, of this year's DPRM theme. Thank you. Twenty twenty was supposed to usher in new beginnings and signify renewed hopes and recharged potentials. But as the Philippines navigated the first quarter, a series of unfortunate events began to unravel. The Taal volcanic eruption, the earthquakes in Mindanao, and a deadly virus spreading worldwide, affecting mostly older people and those with compromised immune systems hospitalizing the infected, 
paralyzing jobs and placing the economy at a standstill. It happened gradually, then suddenly, it became out of hand. The COVID-19 has plunged the Philippines and the world into a crisis like no other. Now we find ourselves home quarantined and socially distanced. And as the pandemic continues to push the world from behind, people ploddingly enter the new normal lost and terrified. With the Philippines' future still uncertain, it is essential to know the serious impediments that slow the country from beating the novel coronavirus and from moving forward from the adverse effects of the socio-economic crisis so we can come up with solutions to help the country get back on its feet. The pandemic has exposed the weaknesses of our governance system, such as the lack of effective coordination between and among government units the absence of clear protocols or manual of operations on managing health emergencies, outdated and fragmented information systems, lack of shared standards and interoperability, lack of reliable tools for targeting beneficiaries of social assistance programs, and an ill-equipped workforce at various levels of local administration. Our government is presented with the challenge of reviving the economy under the new normal and the perennial threat of pandemics, climate change, food insecurity, and fiscal crises. Meanwhile, the business sector needs to reshape itself to thrive in a more uncertain and competitive environment. The academe is left to look for more innovative approaches to sustain education delivery in the new normal and to keep up with the fourth industrial revolution. And there's a troubling rise of public discontent due to limited resources and mobility, and increasing joblessness and poverty. The coronavirus pandemic and other risk factors threaten our sustained economic progress and attainment of sustainable development. To move forward and recover from this crisis and face other challenges, we need to innovate governance across all sectors of society to steer the country toward renewed growth and dynamism. We must, more than ever, work together as one nation to defeat this pandemic. This fight can be won with a concerted effort of all sectors of society. We can treat this pandemic as an opportunity to establish an innovative and agile governance system capable of managing risks and crises. The government should take the lead in creating an environment conducive to learning and innovation by addressing institutional coordination and infrastructural issues. It should strengthen the capacities of the civil service through continuous professional development and by establishing a reward and incentive system that emphasizes productivity and innovation. Government offices should develop smart systems to hasten the delivery of public services. To boost the country's resilience to risks and disasters, continuous human capital formation is a must. There should be more efficient access to healthcare services, broad-based access to quality education, and more effective social protection systems. Public and private sector agencies should update and foster interconnection and integration of information systems, promote data sharing and digitalization, and work together toward the advancement of the IT infrastructure. In aiming for organizational agility, the business sector must revisit and redefine their strategies and strive for survivability and resilience. The academe should be ready to provide flexible learning options for students to continue their education. To prepare young people for jobs of the future, the curriculum should include both cognitive and socio-emotional development and should be responsive to the needs of industry. Civil society organizations should also innovate their strategies and processes to better reach sectors that have limited access to government channels. The general public also plays a key role in helping the country bounce back in the new normal. Citizens must be open to new ways of doing things. They should be adaptive and innovative in the face of adversity and change. 
They should retool and retrain by taking advantage of free learning opportunities. They must have an entrepreneurial mindset to thrive amid loss of income and rising unemployment. Despite the devastation that we are facing, we need to have faith that there is light at the end of the tunnel, and this shall soon pass. We should continue to focus our energies on mitigating the spread of the virus, on saving the economy from the damage caused by the pandemic, and on assisting affected sectors in coping with this crisis. Every September, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies leads the entire nation in celebrating the Development Policy Research Month, or DPRM, to emphasize the importance of policy research in the formulation of evidence-based policy interventions to current and emerging development concerns. This year, we chose Innovating Governance for the New Normal as the theme of the 2020 DPRM to rouse our collective consciousness as a nation toward one goal, to bounce back from this crisis by improving the way we govern ourselves and our country. The DPRM's main and culminating activity is the Annual Public Policy Conference, or APPC, which convenes and engages policymakers and analysts, social scientists, and representatives from the government, private sector, and civil society in a rational and evidence-based discussion of issues, opportunities, and policy options. With this year's DPRM celebration, we hope to encourage our fellow civil servants and other development actors and stakeholders to be innovative and agile to help our country move forward from this pandemic. Together, we can bounce back stronger in the new normal. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. We have an excellent group of panelists today. Professor Joho Lee of the Korean Development Institute will talk about transforming education. Mr. Sean McDonald of Frontline SMS Digital Public will share his experience in building trust for data governance. Chairman Leboro of the National Privacy Commission will share his expertise in Philippine ICT Public Administration. Professor Ron Mendoza of Ateneo de Manila University will give an academic perspective, while Attorney Aiken Serzo will talk of Philippine technology law and regulatory reform. But before we start, I would like to remind the speakers and panelists of their time limit. For speakers, you have 25 minutes each. For panelists, you have 15 minutes each. When there are only five minutes left, you will hear this alert. When time is up, you will hear this alert. Thank you. So the first speaker for today is a professor at the Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy and Management and a commissioner of the International Commission on Financing the Global Educational Opportunity, the Education Commission. He served as Minister of Education, Science and Technology of the Republic of South Korea in 2010 to 2013, before joining the ministry as vice minister in 2009 to 2010. He was senior secretary to the president for education, science and culture in 2008, and a member of the National Assembly in 2004 to 2007. He has written several articles and authored a number of publications, such as the human capital and development lessons and insights from Korea's transformation and positive changes, the education, science, and technology policies of Korea. He received his bachelor's and master's degree from Seoul National University and his PhD in economics from Cornell University in 1990. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming um, Professor Joho Lee to talk on high touch, high tech, transforming education after COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sikat, for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm very honored uh, to give a presentation in front of very distinguished participants uh, in the APPC seminar organized by, uh, by the uh, 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 PIDS. Uh, so uh, my talk today is about high-touch, high-tech, uh, transforming education after COVID-19. And I will first talk about education in the era of post industrial revolution. And I will suggest high touch, high tech as a major direction for change. And as a former Minister of Education, Science and Technology of South Korea, uh, I will discuss uh, KEDU, uh, the potential and strategy. And also, as a, a chair of uh, Education Commission Asia, uh, I will talk. Of, I will uh, share the experience of high touch high tech initiative of uh, ECA. So, in the uh, right upper side of this uh, slide, you can see uh, Go Master Shadow Lee. Uh, I'm a big fan of him, I, and and in in. In one of hotel uh, in Seoul, uh, South Korea, in 2016, uh, he was uh, completely defeated by a uh, UK player. Uh, it's not a human being; it's actually uh, artificial intelligence made by uh, the, the uh, machine learning company uh, called uh, DeepMind. So this really shows the beginning of new era of post-industrial revolution. And you know that uh, uh, AI and big data is uh, a ma major driving forces in the post-industrial revolution. And you, in the same year, 2016, when uh, the master Lee was defeated by AI, uh, Davos Forum, uh, World Economic Forum, uh, highlighted that 65% of current elementary school students, uh, uh, they, uh, they will uh, get, I mean, the, they will have jobs that do not uh, yet exist today due to the AI-led force in the revolution. So uh, this has a huge uh, implication in education. So education uh, should incite fundamental change in what we learn and how we teach. So uh, in the typical classroom, uh, the traditional classroom, uh, we usually focus on uh, teachers delivering knowledge, students uh, memorizing and understanding the contents. But you know that uh, the size of knowledge or content uh, has been uh, doubling almost in every 12 hours, uh, according to the uh, expert. So you cannot make students memorize every uh, detailed knowledge in, in the classroom. So what we should do is to focus on core concept and, and, and make students to know about essential knowledge, uh, so, so you know that the, 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 the typical uh, national curriculum like uh, what like Korea has uh, should be really changed uh, fundamentally to focus more on core concepts. And based on those foundations, you, you really have to emphasize data literacy, uh, technological literacy, human literacy, and also, uh, you uh, have to uh, think about nurturing soft skills, uh, uh, often called 4C, uh, creativity, critical thinking, uh, collaboration, and, and communication. So these, uh, the menu of uh, you, the, the learning uh, you, should, you, should, you should learn, uh, for your, I mean, the, you should teach for your next generation have to be really changed a lot, right? 
And, and what about uh, how to teach? You know, that in education, what to teach and how to teach are two major areas, right? So uh, how to teach uh, has, has to be changed also fundamentally, uh, like uh, change from mass production system to mass customized system, customization system in, 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 in the market, uh, product and service market. In education, uh, likewise, uh, mass standardization system should be changed to a uh, mass personalization system, meaning that personalized learning should be provided to everyone. It, you, the personalized learning, uh, regarded as the optimal way of learning, uh, uh, used to be uh, provided to the only uh, selected few through a private school education, very expensive uh, uh, private tutors and so forth. But uh, due to the uh, technological change, now personalized learning can be basically provided. Uh, so, uh, in those in this direction of change, uh, learning to take tests should be changed to learning to learn, uh, vertical learning in the classroom uh, or in in the uh, in, in, in the lack of I uh, mean the the uh, uh, majorly through uh, lectures should be changed to horizontal learning through projects and discussion among students, and also sh shallow learning, uh, uh, focusing, I mean, based on uh, memorization and understanding should be uh, uh, developed to uh, deep learning uh, to provide students more high order uh, skills. So uh, to make that kind of shift, uh, harnessing the power of AI in education is critical. So uh, AI can help identify what a student does and does not know uh, through AI-powered uh, diagnostic testing and, and develop a personalized learning path for each student. So for example, uh, you, can, you can now see the, the beginning of a really uh, important game changer in, in, this, in the education field. Uh, which is intelligent tutoring system. Maybe you can call this uh, AI tutor. So AI can uh, can play a very important role as a tutor for each individual student for the personalized learning. And ITS uh, can be uh, applied in, in dialogue-based uh, tutoring system or even exploratory learning environment uh, and you can uh, you can think about the tools like chatbot or, or VR and AR to uh, to in, uh, on the top of uh, ITS, and this ITS can be even further developed uh, to become an AI learning companion or AI teaching uh, assistant in the near future. So uh, on the one hand, you can think about a big change uh, in education through embracing uh, AI technologies. On the other, you can, you can uh, reimagine a uh, teacher's uh, role transformed by uh, through this change. The teachers are not the stage on the stage anymore, and uh, they should become uh, trans transformed to become a designer of learning environment. And uh, so there are a lot of uh, important pedagogies, uh, innovative pedagogies uh, for teachers to uh, utilize. So for example, branded learning, uh, gamification, computational thinking, experiential learning, uh, these are widely tested uh, in, in the past 10 or 20 years and now become quite effective. Uh, but you know that this change in teachers should be accompanied by uh, embracing uh, AI technologies in, in the classroom. Otherwise, teachers are too much a burden, right? So uh, that's the, the direction uh, that I suggest uh, for the uh, global community uh, that uh, the education should become should become high touch, uh, high tech. I define high touch, high tech education in this way. So, uh, in, so on the left-hand side first, uh, oh, sorry, right-hand side, 
first, you can see uh, the new uh, role of uh, AI. Okay, so the, by embracing AI technologies, so um, as I said, uh, diagnostic capacity uh, to identify students' uh, prior knowledge and uh, at, and levels are quite important, and also the. Uh, uh, instruction uh, tailored to uh, individual uh, learning levels and needs. So, you know, that uh, AI can offer optimized learning path for everyone uh, based on their needs and, and levels of learning. And on the left-hand side, uh, you have to combine this technology with new roles of teachers. So teachers can focus more on uh, for personalized guidance, active learning experience like project-based learning, or mentoring and social and emotional learning. So, uh, you know that uh, you can see here the clear uh, division of roles between uh, human teacher and AI tutor. So you have to bring in AI tutor and you can help teachers make the big transformation in their role. So this uh, is another diagram to show this kind of uh, transformation. So in the typical classroom, uh, according to uh, Bloom, uh, the famous education uh, theorist, uh, students first uh, remember, learn to remember and understand. And based on what they learn, uh, remember and understand, uh, they can learn how to apply, analyze, evaluate, and create, uh, through, well, particularly with, through uh, human connection. But uh, usually in the traditional classroom, uh, they just focus on uh, understanding and remembrance because it's, it takes much burden of teachers to provide all uh, learning experience up to uh, creation. So uh, high touch, high tech can provide a solution because uh, by bringing in uh, AI technology, uh, this uh, uh, area of learning, understanding and remembrance can be done by done with AI. So teachers are uh, radically relieved uh, burden uh, on this area, so they can move up uh, to focus more on higher uh, order uh, learning. So applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. So this is a uh, uh, high touch, high tech uh, uh, There has been already uh, some positive evidence for high touch, high tech education. Uh, Arizona State University in the United States uh, already uh, benefited 65,000 students uh, in 12 core courses through high touch, high tech learning. They call actually high tech, high touch, but I actually changed the order because maybe uh, the high touch should be more emphasized, although we really have to embrace high tech course. And in India, MindSpark uh, experiment uh, draw a lot of attention in the academia uh, by showing the increase in test scores, high uh, in test uh, increase. So uh, you can see here that uh, in the freshman courses in Arizona State University, they offer um, basic courses like mathematics, physics, uh, uh, biology, uh, even economics, uh, through uh, adaptive learning system. So they bring in, for example, Becro here is Alex uh, to teach uh, college algebra course, and and they they bring in Kak folks to teach economics, uh, Sengage in other uh, subjects. So they can utilize a diverse uh, software. AI software to help students to uh, to study with AI tutor, while professors focus more on project-based learning. 
So uh, especially uh, after pandemic, uh, many schools and, and universities uh, have been paying attention to uh, online learning platform, uh, but uh, you know that uh, we really have to develop online learning platform uh, through uh, using AI tools, AI digital tools. So for example, in ASU, they uh, utilize more than 130 digital tools, uh, mostly uh, assisted by artificial intelligence technology. So uh, this is the example of high, high, high tech. But uh, high tech cannot, I think, stand alone. We really have to make professors, teachers to uh, adjust or adapt to the new uh, environment where AI can help uh, teachers, in, especially in uh, uh, content knowledge. Uh, so teachers, professors can focus more on high order learning uh, through product-based learning and experience, experiential learning and so forth. So let me uh, move on to uh, K-Edu. Uh, you know that uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I can see the smile of uh, Sika. Probably you like uh, BTS, right? Rather than <laughs> Sai. <laughs> BTS is more popular for younger generation <laughs> here in Korea. But uh, you know that uh, this is really the example of high touch, high tech in in uh, in, uh, in in the in the cultural uh, sector because one of the reasons I understand that BTS has made a very positive influence over uh, youth is in. in, in uh, globally is uh, because they actively uh, utilizing uh, the uh, digital communication technologies like YouTube. So they share their personal uh, I mean, the connections and feelings uh, and, and sentiments and their songs with the, uh, the, uh, with the uh, youth, uh, a lot of youth uh, the young uh, students, young generation, uh, through uh, uh, digitized uh, communication technologies. So uh, we have been uh, having a, a huge, a big debate uh, within South Korea whether uh, education in Korea can also become like K-pop, providing a positive influence on uh, youth base globally. So uh, one of the, the reasons why we have been discussing this is that uh, Korea could be an, a good example of uh, investment in human capital, uh, utilize, I mean, in, investing in human capital and, and, and it, it, it became a, a key uh, factor uh, to the success in, in economy uh, as well as uh, in, in politics. So Korea has has been rapidly uh, the, uh, developed and also uh, democratized, mainly due to its investment in people. Right? So the uh, left hand side shows a very rapid increase in per capita GDP in Korea. Uh, it parallels uh, the uh, increase in enrollment, but also very rapid and and, and kind of uh, focusing on uh, the 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 poor family kids force, so very progressive universalism. And another uh, uh, experience Korea can share is that uh, in Korea, the best students enter the teaching profession. So top 5% aspiring to become teachers, uh, proportion of them are highest in Korea, uh, with a big margin to the second. So uh, to the uh, young generation, uh, they want to become teachers or head of doctors or head of uh, even uh, lawyers um, and so forth because you know, teaching has been regarded as very uh, respectable uh, job with a uh, uh, very good uh, payment. So uh, how then we can turn this potential into uh, 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 an opportunity? Uh, we, I suggest three strategies uh, of uh, KEDU. 
And maybe this can also apply to other countries like uh, Philippines. So, um, so I suggest three uh, key uh, ways uh, to harness the power of education, uh, power of AI in education. The first one is uh, setting up AI in education by opening up. When you really want to embrace AI technology in education, you first have to open the door to edit the companies in the private sector. Korea used to uh, close the door to the uh, private uh, companies. So mainly uh, schools, uh, universities, they uh, don't really want to purchase EdTech uh, products. Rather, they want, they want to um, make order to public institution to provide uh, required technologies and so forth. But uh, you know that uh, private sector is more active in, in innovation. Uh, especially in AI technologies in education. So I really uh, uh, suggest that uh, we, we, hope we have to first open up internally, particularly for uh, EdTech uh, private sector companies. Secondly, uh, opening up uh, internally. So uh, this hyper high tech uh, educational change uh, should be applied to everyone in, uh, in the global community. So we really have to uh, share experience and learn from each other in expanding high-tech high -tech education. And uh, so um, the, the major strategy I suggest uh, to the Korean policymakers is that we really have to nurture uh, ecosystem of education, innovation, uh, where uh, globally competent ed tech companies are emerging and expanding globally in cooperation with education pioneers in applying, evaluating, and creating a high tech high tech solution. So, uh, and, and also making uh, them collaborate with teachers, professors at schools, universities to bring about uh, uh, student potential. So, we do need a uh, very healthy uh, ecosystem uh, where you can expect uh, innovation in learning solutions, learning technologies every day. And the second uh, strategy is turning crisis into opportunity. Pandemic is uh, the, really the crisis that makes uh, educators to uh, re, uh, reconfigurate uh, education design education. Uh, so this is really a valuable moment, ironically, for educate, education innovators. So uh, one, of, one of the reasons why we think Korea could, uh, could become a uh, leader in, in this area is that because Korea uh, achieved a top performance in the, through the uh, old antiquated learning system. So we put a uh, huge uh, resources in test taking business and also uh, making teachers to push students to uh, higher their test scores. Uh, but there has been also a very uh, sharply rising discontent. So the uh, students are not happy uh, in school and teachers, uh, they are losing self efficacy despite uh, high salaries and so forth. So this really makes uh, Korea to rethink education and maybe uh, more open to embrace uh, new ways of learning and teaching. So the pandemic, this pandemic really provided momentum uh, to this kind of change. So uh, as I said, Korea uh, used to close their doors to the, uh, especially to remote learning tools and opportunities, but they opened up after the pandemic. Uh, and you know that the Google Classroom uh, MS team uh, has never, had never been allowed to use in the classroom uh, in Korea before pandemic, but all changed after the pandemic. After the use of those tools, uh, there has been a really uh, uh, important change in the mindset of teachers. They, they, have, they show a high satisfaction, and, and they even uh, answered 
that they will use uh, remote learning in the future. So maybe uh, without pandemic, uh, we, we cannot uh, expect this kind of high response rate of uh, high uh, level of satisfaction and high uh, high response. Uh, in the use of further learning, uh, further use of uh, remote learning, but the uh, pandemic really made made the teachers an opportunity to experience of the, these amazing technologies and uh, change their mindset to embrace new technology. So this pandemic, uh, ironically, provides a really a big momentum for Korea to embrace new change. So uh, I, I suggest uh, uh, the third strategy, which is uh, gradually uh, implementing fundamental change. You know that when I was minister, I really didn't uh, 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 didn't uh, I I was not really ambitious to make uh, this kind of fundamental change. I haven't known this uh, new uh, technologies uh, uh, could really make, make a, a big impact in education. But now I became to believe that we really have to go for fundamental change rather than incremental change. But it should be uh, done step by step, like a startup community where they do uh, start small and then scale smart, right? So like likewise, uh, the policymakers just just think about uh, gradual implementation of fundamental change. So, uh, lastly, uh, I want to share uh, high touch high tech initiative of Education Commission Asia. So, um, I I was a minister of Education Science and Technology of. Um, in the period between 2010 and 2013. And I came back to academia uh, uh, to, to teach students in KDI school uh, after 2013. And from 2015, I became uh, uh, invited uh, by Education Global Education Commission as a commissioner. And um, based on my experience in working for the uh, global community, I uh, thought that uh, maybe uh, we really can think about the Asia Hub of Education Commission. So uh, I helped establish a new institution, uh, Education Commission Asia, and we started a uh, high touch high tech initiative uh, mainly from this year. So uh, first one is uh, high touch high tech consortium. It's, it's for universities. So I, uh, I asked university presidents to join forces and work together uh, to uh, introduce AI tutors in their uh, freshman courses, like, like what ASU has done uh, for the past uh, 10 years, or, or seven or eight years. So uh, the Education Commission Asia provided a kind of a platform where uh, on, on, on the one side, you can invite uh, university uh, innovators. So we invited uh, 15 universities uh, to form a consortium. And on the other side, we invited uh, the, uh, the, uh, the companies, uh, edutech companies, uh, able to provide uh, AI uh, tutoring uh, services. So uh, we invited global companies like uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, Cengage, uh, Pearson, and Wiley. And at the same time, we also try to nurture uh, Korean companies. Uh, while they are not really uh, globally competitive yet, but uh, we, we had a, a company called, Korean company called Lead, uh, which provide very good AI-assisted uh, uh, personalized learning in English. So uh, we actually invite both uh, domestic and global companies to work with uh, Korean university innovators to uh, design high touch, high tech uh, curriculum and so forth. So uh, we uh, 
Uh, can the Commission Asia help develop uh, and distribute guides for utilizing AI in education and offer training and seminars for university faculty members and host forums to create an atmosphere of university education innovation and devise measures to motivate uh, participating for faculty members and also support the selection and operation of pilot programs for personalized learning. So for the uh, companies, we provide a, a, a so-called testbed university so that they can test their AI tutor uh, software for Korean students. And on the other side, we provide uh, the uh, universities an opportunity to learn from each other and also from the experts. Uh, we actually invite uh, an uh, expert from ASU to uh, to share their experience in uh, introducing hyper high tech education. So uh, we started with uh, 15 universities uh, last month, but uh, it already gained the momentum. So we will have additional 15 university members uh, next month. And the second program is a K-12 program uh, focusing on the disadvantaged kids. So the uh, first we experiment with a uh, high-tech high -tech, uh, program uh, for uh, North Korean uh, defectors, you know that because they uh, except escaped from uh, North Korea, so the uh, their um, the uh, level of uh, learning has been really diverse. So the, the uh, implementing the typical Korean uh, curriculum is really not easy. So uh, we worked with the teachers there, and they found. Uh, this AI uh, tutor is very, very effective uh, in teaching uh, North Korean adolescent defectors. And also uh, multicultural students. So we have many students whose mother came from Philippines or Vietnam and other Asian countries particularly. Uh, so they have problems in, in, in uh, basic, uh, basic courses. So uh, we, uh, to high touch high tech programs with the uh, funding from other uh, uh, foundations who are interested in uh, those uh, multicultural students uh, learning. And, and also we are really trying hard to uh, benefit low income students first. So uh, you know that the, even Gangnam area, the Sochogu has uh, many students from low-income families. So we provide the, uh, the AI learning devices and mentoring uh, services for those kids. So we work with local uh, local city government, and, and also Daegu City also had uh, started uh, a, a program including 1,000 uh, students and lastly, uh, high touch high tech uh, can also go global. So uh, we actually uh, did this uh, very interesting uh, prototype project for the uh, Vietnam, and uh, uh, we uh, worked with the Vietnam Ministry of Education uh, and Training, and UK's uh, DPIT uh, provided funding. Uh, this is not by uh, Education Commission Asia, but it's uh, Education Commission itself, uh, when I worked as a commissioner. So, uh, and also uh, ASU experts uh, uh, came to uh, uh, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City uh, to teach teachers there. And also we, have, we invited uh, Becker Hill's team uh, where uh, the the who I mean the were located in uh, Singapore uh, for the Asia branch. So they uh, ASU team and McRoy team uh, work together to provide uh, tailorized uh, training uh, programs for Vietnam teachers, so that Vietnam teachers can deliver high touch high tech learning experience for this uh, for uh, prototype schools. 
two in Hanoi and two in Ho Chi Minh City. And we had a really impressive uh, impact uh, evaluation. Uh, test scores show if the students, um, on average, their scores improved by 0.436 standard deviation, which is equivalent to two years of learning. So just by uh, a, semester, uh, a, a semester intervention, uh, we had uh, two year, years of learning impact. And more important, uh, the students who left behind showed much bigger uh, improvement through uh, high touch, high tech learning. So uh, now uh, Education Commission Asia uh, take turns uh, to uh, pursue a feasibility study uh, after the very successful Education Commission prototype project. And we are talking with ADB. Uh, I mean, the, actually, I visited ADB Manila office in January uh, this year, uh, mainly uh, to discuss about this project. And uh, we are quite in, in good uh, uh, collaboration now. And lastly, it's uh, high tech, high tech Uruguay. And the uh, Uruguay is uh, one of the advanced a uh, country in digital learning in Latin America. And so we have uh, co-designed uh, the high tech high tech program for Uruguay uh, teachers, um, more than 100 teachers in 30 schools and, and for 250, uh, I mean 2050, uh, 2,500 students, I'm sorry. So uh, this is uh, the experience we had in uh, Education Commission Asia. So uh, to summarize, uh, we have, you know, that we have a very, uh, not very long uh, uh, period uh, in, in, in uh, designing and implementing all these uh, very uh, interesting uh, projects for higher education and also for uh, K to 12, uh, the underprivileged students and also uh, global students, but uh, so, but I mean the uh, uh, I have a very big uh, the uh, aspiration that uh, based on although short uh, but a very uh, interesting experience uh, in in high tech high tech uh, projects, uh, maybe we can. Uh, share this experience globally, um, maybe first with uh, Philippine leaders, uh, how we can make a real difference for the future generation. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of BTS fans here in the Philippines as well. Now, so the next speaker will be talking about the backbone needed uh, for information as institutions. Uh, he is a chief executive officer of Frontline SNS, co-founder of Digital Public, a senior fellow of the Center for Intelligent International Governance Innovation. He builds governance for technology and technology for governance. He is the co-founder of Digital Public, the chief executive officer of Frontline SNS, and uh, he holds a dual Juris Doctor and Master of Arts in International Affairs degree from American University with specializations in international law and alternative dispute resolution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. Sean McDonald to discuss building a digital public, public interest technology data and trust. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you well. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to present to this incredible group of people. Uh, so my name is Sean. I, I started a lot of this coming from an organization called Frontline SMS, where what we do is build technology for humanitarian response and public services. So we've in a lot of ways, 
uh, worked at the other end of the technology spectrum from the previous speaker in the sense that we've worked with very low tech uh, and in often in, in often very low touch circumstances. That work led me to uh, start exploring contact tracing under the uh, in, in the response to the Ebola epidemic. And um, some of you may recall that there were a significant number of calls to use mobile phone data and big data technologies to do contact tracing during that response effort. And after a significant amount of research, what we ended up finding was that that those approaches fundamentally weren't effective and they weren't effective, not because the data was especially bad, but because data wasn't able to capture the things that fun that underpinned Ebola transmission. And so for the last five years, I've been looking at how do we both ensure quality in the way that we build technologies during disaster, but also in the way that we more broadly roll out public and public interest technologies. And so, um, of course, with COVID-19 and, and the global response, and, and in many ways, the global and digital response, we've seen a significant amount of development effort go into technology and technology-led responses. And again, contact tracing has become a, uh, a key part of that. But I think that one of the things that's also really valuable to remember is that we're, we're seeing quite a number of different ways that the narratives around contact tracing are presented. And so when we're, we're thinking about uh, uh, what is it that COVID has taught us or that the, the process of developing technologies to respond to COVID has taught us. I wanted to share a few of the lessons that I think both emerged from the Ebola experience, but also are very relevant in the global process. And one of them, I think, is about validation. Fundamentally, we don't have a very great we don't have the, the technology industry generally and most governments specifically don't have a strong infrastructure for evaluating whether or not technologies not only work in the sense that they perform the technological functions that they espouse to, but whether or not they have a meaningful impact in solving the problem that the technology is being deployed to solve. I think one of the things that we often forget when we talk about contact tracing apps or various technologies is that the goal is not a successful app deployment per se. The goal is a, is, a, is a successful public health response. And what we found is that even in places where adoption has been very high, 40% of Icelanders have adopted a, a contact tracing app of one stripe or another, it hasn't been a meaningful intervention. It hasn't been a meaningful addition to the public health response. And so the first, and I think, one of the really important things to remember when we're talking about technologies, whether it's in um, education or disaster response or any other sector, uh, it's that we need strong validation infrastructure to do not only quality assurance testing, but to do the kind of comparative and contextual testing to make sure that the technology helps solve the larger problem. The second, of course, is, is equality and, and deployment to an extent. One of the things that we've learned from COVID response is that in order for it to be effective, we need COVID response efforts to reach as many people if as possible, if not everybody. And a lot of the technology platforms that we all use are fragmented. Some people use Android. Android means a million different things. There are some people use other software systems. Um, there are a whole number of different factors that go into how easy it is to roll out new technology solutions on, on, on platforms that reach everybody. And the thing, one of the things that was historic in some ways about the private sector response was that Google and Apple, who are historically, in, at least uh, in, in the United States, are, are kind of dominant players, um, join forces for this technology and you know, for, this, for this intervention, for this protocol. And yet, underlying it, they still don't reach a significant number of people. <clears throat> and then, of course, as, as was raised earlier, <clears throat> technology is not a standalone solution. And so we have to recognize that anytime we deploy a technology into the world, we're also deploying it into contexts and power relationships and 
and, and concerns that people have that surround the technology. And so in a lot of instances, I think we have to recognize the fact that law enforcement will play a role in the way that we approach big public interest initiatives, particularly those administered by and through technology, and that that kind of law enforcement may not necessarily pay the same amount of attention to the technical details and the nuance as we do while we're developing the algorithms or uh, assigning and analyzing the data structures. And then, of course, there are all kinds of commercial leakages in the system. There are a number of ways in which it is difficult for people in technology to trust the integrity of a system and that a commercial provider won't take information uh, collected by them and repurpose it or resell it. And if that sounds like a, a dire thing, it's, it's certainly happened not only from companies, but also in, in you know, organization, humanitarian organizations, development organizations designed to solve these problems. And then, of course, there are political problems uh, where often or sometimes um, governments or or the appearance of governments are, are, are um, used to target political ends. And so all of these factors are tremendously influential in the minds of people who are experiencing emergency um, as, as cost benefit factors and whether or not it's a good thing for them to adopt public technologies. And I think that oftentimes we, we try and uh, calculate or program or code trust or build things that are so sophisticated that they seem like they deserve trust. But in a lot of instances, what we're finding is that trust issues are actually significantly larger than the technology itself. And that when the public is not brought along with advances in these approaches and with the education and transparency and accountability that accompany new initiatives, typically they can actively harm response efforts. And uh, some of you may have seen Edelman. Uh, there's a firm called Edelman, which does an annual survey of, of people's trust, um, small t trust in, in sectors. And what they've found is that roundly technology causes at least a small incremental change in the way that people feel about different sectors. And in a lot of ways, it's worthwhile to say that technology is not only a factor in the sense that it becomes an interface, it becomes an intermediary in the way that people experience different services, but it also becomes a surface and a channel through which public officials may delegitimize or, or unfortunately damage the effectiveness of public programs. Uh, I'm sure you've seen in some way or another that the United States is as the most severe version of, of the, the COVID outbreak in the world. And it's in no small part due to the fact that we have uh, very low participation in public efforts. And, and also some of that comes from the fact that public officials are, um, are messaging in ways that are counterproductive. So we have technology amplifying distrust issues. We also have technology amplifying damaging messaging. Uh, this is an example where a, a study found that there were correlations between people's news sources and their likelihood for um, being infected with COVID and dying from COVID in different populations in the United States. So thinking about the public messaging footprint and our relation and the relationship that different both technological and public policy initiatives have um, is extremely important not only in the design of the technology but also in the way that that technology is introduced and explained back out to the public too often what we do when we are looking at evaluating technologies is we under we're trying to understand whether or not um, it it does the, the technological thing, whether or not you know it sends the text message, it automates the process, it it um, runs the algorithm. But unfortunately, in context, those contextual factors very often overwhelm the importance of any specific technological feature. Said more bluntly, contact tracing apps, like many public interest technologies, are fundamentally political. And what we're seeing is that not only are they political in the way that people respond to them, 
that they're increasingly political in the way that they are required and deployed in a growing range of settings. So our natural risk aversion and often our kind of commodification of risk, the way that we use things like insurance uh, to manage risk, start to encourage us to adopt things like contact tracing apps, even before the science is clear enough to be sure that it's adding any real value. And of course, this isn't just happening in any one place. We're starting to see that a range of institutions are making different technologies compulsory. The legal justifications for this from, and, and the policy justifications for this are really interesting. But rather than getting terribly into them, I think this, this adoption and this compulsion was relatively inevitable once we started putting them into production. And so I think it's really important to recognize that when when the types of treatment, when the when the process, contact tracing is a process that is designed to be linked to care. So analog or, or non, you know, not particularly technological contact tracing is designed to help connect people to healthcare systems, to testing. When you are reached by a contact tracer, you're talking to a person. When you get a notification from an app, when you deal with a technology interface, it's much harder to have the kind of basic conversations that you want to receive the reassurances that you need and often to receive that same quality of connection to care and most importantly if what you're saying you know if, if someone has told you that you have a disease or the likelihood of a disease and then you know that not to be true and you get referred to customer service as opposed to someone can, who can help you, and this has an effect on your job or your mobility, these are very real issues. And customer service is so often governed by, perhaps you've guessed, terms of service. And perhaps they are the least read type of document on the internet, um, but they are unfortunately also where a lot of these main, main and major governance decisions are made and a lot of people um, both don't have the time and fundamentally reading a long contract that tells you that you don't have a lot of, of rights or recourse isn't a great use of anybody's time anyway. So there is a growing perception, a majority of people who worry that, tech, that technology is out of control and that the people, both the people and the institutions who, who could or who should be reining it in aren't, aren't doing it effectively. And what's happening is as we adopt and increase the amount of technology that we put into our fundamental public systems, we're seeing really strong trust and adoption blowback. Not only are we seeing, as we've seen, kind of lack uh, or diminutions in trust and decreases in, in um, overall perceptions of these institutions, but we're seeing them starting to lack fundamental honesty. In other words, the effects of digitization are in some ways feeding concerns about the underlying um, uh, transparency of the institutions. That is, of course, not the goal of any digital transformation and, and not, in fact, not endemic or necessary at all. Um, from my perspective, I think that this starts back at how it is that we acknowledge what we do with experimentation and innovation. Um, a lot of us have seen that important ethics trials and, and uh, important ethics trials have driven things like the fundamental architecture of biomedical ethics. Biomedical, biomedical ethics in many ways came uh, in, from elements of Nuremberg trials after World War II and then um, fleshed out and made a much larger and more robust practice from the Belmont Report. But fundamentally, the, the area of experimentation ethics recognizes that when we ask people to take risks, those risks need to be calculated and they need to be based on science and value and then there need to be an, a, a higher level of protections afforded to people. Those are implicit in the way that we govern experiments, but they are not implicit in the way that we develop technologies or the way that we talk about innovation. And in a lot of ways, those have also made science and innovation and consequently experimentation conversations, very political. And we're starting to see perhaps quite dangerous uh, political influence in affecting or influencing the rollout, not only of technology products, but of science and the way that we conduct research in, in really critical times. And I think that 
one of the things that we've all experienced in different ways and are certainly seeing play out across the world is that expert systems and science is no different are increasingly recognizing their need to be able to cope not only with intra-organizational or intra-industrial politics, but with resistance and independence to externally created politics and, and political pressures. And so this is a just a very high level set of differences between the way that experimentation ethics and law treat research settings versus the way they treat applied clinical practice. And rather than read it, I think, read it to you, I think that the valuable thing to recognize here is that when we roll out new technologies, whether they're in public institutions or in response to disasters, we're fundamentally rolling out experimental or what would historically happen in research contexts into practice arenas. That's not totally new. We, we have the infrastructure to do this. Medicine does this with vaccine trials quite regularly. The world in response to COVID has done some of the most inspiring, probably vaccine and initial research coordination work in, in modern public health. But there are these accountability infrastructures. The governance infrastructures aren't just broadly stated principles and they're not um, buried in contracts. The, the things that make that kind of go, um, experimentation and go-to-market process ethical and viable in a public way are all of these infrastructures that create real accountability for bad science, for negative impacts, and a range of other harms. So really the argument and the question is, what is the infrastructure for public interest technology look like? And that, that experimentation, that question is what brought me to data trusts. Um, for those of you who are not aware um, or who've never encountered this, trusts are a broadly used term. Um, they originate from common law, uh, but they are they have lots of analogies and different kinds of law. They're legal tools that, that enable one person to oversee the rights or the property of another person. And it creates what's called a fiduciary duty, which is a legal enforceably, a legally enforceable duty to accountability um, to the people whose rights and, and assets you're managing. So a data trust is that is that same construction, it's that same relationship, that assignment of authority, but it's applied to digital rights. And the goal here is that in many of our contexts around data and digital rights, we just fundamentally don't have the tools for enforcement. And so there are all kinds of ways in which we can build those infrastructures, but relying on a perfect solution in many ways is not how experimentation works. And so data trusts also create uh, continuity and sustainability to make sure that if, if, if a management or a project goes, goes bankrupt or bust, then that data still cannot be used to harm the interests of the people who participated in initially. Data trusts are also a way to start creating and constructing governance. So you can involve a diversity of people who are, who are affected by a program in designing it and in influencing how the data in that system or the technologies underlying it develop over time. Um, this may sound theoretical, it may sound conceptual, but of course, there are a number of, of critical data rights issues already hurtling uh, through the headlines and through a number of public policy issues. And there are, of course, a resulting number of data trusts that are starting to be developed to manage these issues. So just briefly, one example is the Johns Hopkins, uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine. Johns Hopkins is a hospital that also runs a research facility. They use a data trust to broker the, the data between their clinical care contexts and their applied research and their applied research units. So that ethical layer enables them to ensure that they apply all of the highest standards and legal requirements uh, to ensure that data is not misused or abused. Similarly, uh, a group called Open Corporates maintains the largest uh, registry of beneficial ownership data in the world. And they were concerned that after all of this work, if they were to go financially, become financially insolvent, that the world would lose this important database. And so they put it in a trust. And so even if their, their core organization in some ways gets compromised or, or, or 
has to close, this core data asset becomes a public good that will outlive them. Similarly, there are a number of, of course, political conversations that are happening both in data and in the administration and management of digital platforms. And a number of important movements believe that um, having possession and ownership of their data and control over the, the fundamental rights embodied in their data is um, a critical part of their ability to participate in communities. And, and they're using data trusts as a way to organize that governance and that representation. And of course, on, in, in some ways on the other, the other side of the pond, Facebook itself um, has, has recently announced and built a trust and, a trust and safety board, an oversight board. And, the, and, and if you look at how it's legally organized, it is in fact a trust, um, it's a data trust. So there are a number of reasons that one might consider using trusts. Um, my goal here is not to suggest that it is the perfect solution to every problem, but it is unique in that it is something that we and, and many different legal jurisdictions around the world are able to build and, and start thinking in terms of what are the things that we need digital systems to do, that we need technologies to accomplish, who needs to be at the table, not only to ensure that they're well designed and that we've avoided the largest potential harms prior to deployment, but to ensure that their ongoing management and use benefits the people that they're originally designed to benefit. And so data trusts become a very flexible and um, form fit uh, tool to, to build this. So um, again, this may sound in some ways quite conceptual, um, we recently helped the World Health Organization through our, who you may have, have, have also observed, um, navigating quite a bit of the political challenges of being the holder of a global perspective on, on health and, and something as dangerous as COVID amidst quite a lot of political maneuvering. And, and certainly um, tensions between different powers have, have created and, and illustrated the importance of being able to govern data in a way that um, is independent and credible in the face of the political contest. We've also worked with an organization called Medan, who's been helping um, build the service infrastructure around WhatsApp fact checking. So WhatsApp obviously has enormous misinformation problems and they're looking to, to external organizations and civil society groups to help understand how to flag and monitor that kind of traffic. And um, that work has also been really interesting from a research and governance perspective. Many of you are, are government officials. Uh, the United States, I imagine quite like your organizations, uh, is trying to figure out what their, how they regulate their own public institutions going through digital transformations. And we work to help the National Oceanic and uh, Atmospheric Administration start to build private relationships with industry, with fishermen that are not just based out of a compliance mandate, but at, based out of a mutual interest in, uh, in conservation and in fisheries management. And uh, lastly, and perhaps most importantly, trusts like most fiduciaries are built um, because they recognize power asymmetries exist. And those power asymmetries may often be the most dramatic for people who are unable to represent their own interests. And of course, children, um, are, are one clear example of that in digital settings. So we help, we're helping uh, UNICEF figure out how to talk about ways that digital systems might proactively design governance for children's rights or to protect the rights of those who are least advantaged. Um, this, is, this is sort of a summary of, of the learnings. Again, I'm, I'm not gonna try and read any of this to you, but I think that things to remember and things to focus on are that what, when we have historically thought about deploying technology as we've done so from a purely functional and infrastructural lens. And I think that what we're finding, particularly in response to major social issues and major um, you know, epidemics and pandemics that affect us all, uh, is that public trust, public education, public engagement, and the ability for the public to credibly understand and enforce their rights in these systems is critical to ensuring their success. Not as a post-condition or pre-condition. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Very interesting.
uh, talk about terms and conditions in Facebook. Uh, uh, Facebook will be changing their terms uh, October 1st, and I haven't even bothered to read yet, so I'm one of your statistics. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, yeah. Um, but more importantly, I think you also raised a very important issue, which is linked to the next speaker. It's about data privacy and building trust in data, especially in digitalization of information, because we are trying to shift towards a national ID system, which is one of the, the things we want to push here in the Philippines, so it could be we could deliver public services better. So, which brings us to the next speaker. He is a seasoned ICT convergence and communications and public administration professional. Having been appointed as the country's first privacy commissioner in March 2016, he fast-tracked data protection policy development in the country with the issuance of the Data Privacy Act's implementing rules and significant policy circulars within the first year of the NPC's establishment effectively working for countries' data privacy and protection rules to be on par with global data protection regulation. In October 2018, he put the country on the world stage by earning the Philippines a voting seat on the exclusive five-member Executive Committee of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, or the ICD-PPC. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Commissioner Raymond Deboro. Thank you. All right. Uh Thank you, uh, Charlotte, and uh, thank you to all the uh, guests uh, of the PIDS. It's always a pleasure uh, uh, guesting here in your annual uh, conference. I've also, you know, uh, used this annual conference as a platform for introducing uh, some of our policy initiatives and recommendations. I remember two years ago, this is also the venue where we introduced our regulatory approach in uh, data privacy uh, by introducing what we call constructive stakeholder engagement and the responsive regulation in, on data protection and privacy. Let me also congratulate our previous speaker, uh, Mr. Sean McDonald, for your very compelling uh, presentation, and Professor Ju Ho Lee, uh, who also really touched a very touch on a very uh, timely topic about uh, education amidst the pandemic. So let me just uh, share to you some of my insights coming in here uh, into this uh, into our uh, uh, and uh, well uh, it's that, that we, it's it's innovating governance digitizing government for 21st century governance so uh, so uh, our key takeaways of course uh, let me discuss first the data privacy act and the philippine covid-19 response and the second part would be in the Philippine Responsive Data Initiative. This is probably the first time, uh, Charlotte and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Celia, uh, you will be hearing this. This is purely conceptual. And if you will be interested in, the, in this initiative, then I would be more than uh, willing, of course, that, that you take the cudgels for this one. So, uh, you know. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, this very unfamiliar pandemic has really created right, a lot of uh, debates and discourse. Foremost is that public health is actually uh, 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 there's a there's a is versus data privacy, and I really feel that this is really a false dilemma where. Uh, 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 observe this, uh, that uh, we believe, firmly believe that public health and data privacy should be uh, on the same side. Because as you have, uh, we, as we have all witnessed uh, here in the country, what has happened here during the start, and I'm flashing to you some of this, and uh, I know that uh, uh, everyone will be familiar about, the, you know, what this, uh, uh, COVID-19 has caused, uh, right, discrimination and stigma. And uh, basically, people with COVID-19 are being discriminated and stigmatized, primarily because foremost, they are being identified. There's uh, always, a, you know, uh, I've heard this suggestion before, and probably even in your own offices, many of the participants here, there's always this question of whether we should be announcing the names of those that have been infected by COVID-19 to effect a better co uh, contact tracing. 
right? So, but recently I just came across this, that months after COVID-19 infection, patients report breathing difficulty and excessive fatigue. Meaning, uh, for those that have suffered COVID-19, the effects, all right, is lingering. And uh, just imagine if you have identified all those who came out positive, then they are now, again, no, pa, pa, they could possibly be subjected to discrimination, to be discriminated from work, discriminated from, uh, they probably have higher insurance premiums because they had COVID-19. So again, uh, I'm uh, showing this uh, very, uh, well, uh, these uh, concrete examples because uh, this has been our journey you know, uh, in this uh, COVID-19 response since very unfamiliar pandemic. Uh, we have always tried uh, and uh, toying around with so many ideas on how we can uh, defeat this. But our job, right, basically, our concern is not only on uh, data misuse, and let me be very uh, clear about this, but our concern is also about data misuse, right? Uh, that we are not fully able to uh, maximize the beneficial use of personal data, right? And uh, for, uh, you know, uh, let me just say this too, that data privacy is about maximizing the beneficial use of data while uh, mitigating risks to prevent harm, right? So, hindi lang uh, that uh, data is being misused, but our concern too is that uh, uh, there should be free flow of information to help defeat the pandemic. You know, COVID-19 and then, you know, uh, the technology and data will be key in defeating COVID-19. This is actually my own quote, uh, but uh, really, and I thought that uh, one thing because, uh, you know, the Spanish flu has been mentioned many times, but I think we have a better chance really of defeating this COVID because of, again, uh, of these factors, technology and data. But our recent experience here in the country has put focus on Philippine data governance and exposed the gaps in overall data management, uh, causing missed opportunities for beneficial use of data. I guess that is really the uh, task of uh, the presenters uh, earlier, especially Mr. Sean McDonald, uh, and as we, you know, um, and, and, and frankly, again, uh, uh, the Data Privacy Act and the National Privacy uh, Commission, we are here to ensure that uh, uh, not only do we uphold data subjects' rights, but uh, uh, we pave the way for free flow of information. So how does the Data Privacy Act contribute in defeating COVID-19? The DPA enables widespread trust. And again, uh, Mr. Sean McDonald touched uh, on this matter in the tail end of his presentation, it's really about trust in the government and business responses to address the pandemic and defeat COVID-19. I particularly like his segue on how technology has been foisted and the government and all this, ha this is happening all over the globe on, uh, uh, again, uh, looking into technologies like contact tracing, probably that could be a matter that can be discussed later, no? but really, uh, we are here to enable widespread trust in everything that uh, we are doing as a government and also the business's response. You know? And uh, we ensure widespread, uh, widespread trust is promoted by reminding government and businesses of their responsibilities and obligations as stewards of the citizens' data. Right? Again, this is very relevant, especially in contact tracing. And we remind them that they should be transparent, that they have a lawful and legitimate uh, 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 they're lawful and legitimate in their purpose, that they balance public safety, again, and citizens' rights. And lastly, that their actions are science and evidence-based. These are very basic questions that we ask government and businesses in responding to COVID-19. We also ensure that widespread trust is promoted by reminding them again, basically information controllers to secure personal data that's preventing its muse, misuse and abuse and reminding them to uphold citizens' rights over their data, how it is going to be used and shared, how can citizens have access to their data and how they can raise concerns over its, its use. So having said all this, we have embarked on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, how do we how how do we actually remind our stakeholders? Is through advice, information, dialogue, and and support. And uh, just to show you, 
uh, let me just uh, advance this slide. We have issued 18 different types of uh, guidance, uh, ranging from uh, guidelines for establishment on the proper handling of customer uh, information to um, COVID-related apps, how do we, uh, our guidance on this. So I invite everyone to check our website. Uh, we have, uh, you know, guidance on work from home. Again, again, the, this is uh, the NPC issuing references and resources for everyone to be guided, right? So um, aside from that, we have also partnered with government agencies like the DOH in uh, sandboxing several initiatives and approaches like the use of telemedicine, right? So let me just jump now to the second part. No? And uh, probably some of you have missed this uh, statement from the president during the last SONA. He said that we must continue to protect Filipinos in the new normal and remind the world that we are responsible stewards of uh, data. And he said that I am committed to protecting both the physical and digital lives of our law-abiding countrymen. countrymen. So let's focus, and uh, this is really our call, uh, focus on the digital data in government, government digitization. And it transforms the government through the following, enhancing access to public services, streamlining of operations, creating new governance model, enhancing uh, the uh, citizen experience. And the digitization is also a strategic mindset and requires a holistic view and comprehensive actions that will enable everyone to exploit opportunities uh, uh, for data, uh, uh, involving data. So um, the, we have several digitization programs already uh, ongoing for the DICT. The third telco projects, actually a major digitization uh, project, the free Wi-Fi, the national broadband plan, the ARTA also the, with the DICT recently initiated a memorandum calling for nationwide automation of government services. And, uh, you know, various uh, government uh, uh, agencies have also embarked on their own uh, uh, digitization programs. But what is really important here, you call it, uh, and I call it the Philippine Responsive Data Initi Initiative, is to digitize all government data in order to improve data quality so that we can undertake uh, data analytics. So the principle of digital first and digitally enabled privacy and security uh, by design, uh, designing our services through policy development to enable service delivery, but more importantly, build data resilience by making uh, by uh, by uh, introducing privacy by design uh, in uh, the design of digital operations, making sure that there are, there's uh, uh, appropriate privacy impact assessment to minimize privacy risks. And uh, third is that to digitally enable frontline services to ensure that tools needed are actually available to all the Filipinos. So all, our objective should be first uh, to uh, digital for all government digital data to be accurate and precise for it to be legitimate and valid reliable and consistent to be timely and relevant complete and comprehensive for data to be available and accessible for it to be granular and unique and lastly but more most importantly to be secure and trusted so the National Privacy Commission has also involved itself in this regard. We have been very active uh, in calling for the digital data governance, participating in the digital governance framework, particularly in the ASEAN. So uh, the ASEAN has initiated uh, what, it, what it calls the uh, ASEAN uh, Digital Data Governance Framework. And uh, again, this is uh, uh, coming from the realization that uh, cross-border data flow will only increase in the coming years through the introduction of uh, all this technology. And they see the framework to really balance consumer protection and practical business and information sharing needs. So the initiatives of the framework are uh, an ASEAN data classification framework, an ASEAN cross-border data flow management, and a digital innovation forum and NASTI organizing the Asia data, ASEAN Data Protection and Privacy Forum. Uh, the ASEAN Data Protection and Privacy Forum is actually chaired uh, and held by the Philippines during its introduction. We were the first to chair this. So I'm really, um, uh, I'd like to really announce this and promote this because this will really, uh, uh, in, in the first quarter of 2021, the digital ministers will be uh, convening and, and in all, uh, the plans do not miscarry, 
uh, they will approve the ASEAN Digital Data Governance Framework, which will again apply to all ASEAN member states. So with that, uh, um, it's, it's really about uh, the Philippines now uh, plunging into serious data governance, data management, and data analytics. Data governance is about establishing the rights on government digital data, who decides on it. The ultimate goal is to determine a holistic way, right, to, to manage or control our data assets. Second is on data management. It includes all the processes of acquiring, validating, storing, and protecting. So, uh, but basically, so he will ask me, uh, data management is the logistics of data, and data governance is the strategy of uh, data. And finally, data analytics, how can we uh, come up with actionable information and useful information uh, to, uh, uh, from all this data? So I will go back again. Data privacy is all about maximizing the beneficial use of personal data while mitigating the risk. So finally, uh, the challenges and is, let me just go uh, over this. Uh, of course, um, you know, uh, digital skills and competencies of government will be very important to be upgraded. And uh, um, there might be resistance to change in this. But uh, hopefully, again, we address all this. Uh, Congress, we need the Congress's support. Uh, and finally, of course, uh, we have to review and assess. But we have to basically come together and run, launch our own uh, digital data governance uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Liboro. It was very informative. And I, I especially like um, not only misuse data, but misuse data. Because especially in research, one of the challenges is a lot of um, incomplete data or not, not really available. So which brings us to our next speaker. He is the Dean and Professor at the Athenian School of Government. From 2011 to 2015, he was an Associate Professor of Economics at the Asian Institute of Management and the Executive Director of the AIM Rizalino S. Navarro Policy Center for Competitiveness. Prior to that, he was a Senior Economist with the United Nations in New York his research background includes work with UNICEF, UNDP, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, the Economist Intelligence Union, and several Manila-based non-governmental organizations. Professor Mendoza obtained his Master in Public Administration and International Development from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and his MA and PhD in Economics from Fordham University. He is uh, what we call a Suki, um, of the conferences here at PIDS, yeah. Professor Ronald U. Mendoza. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to share uh, some thoughts on the topic for today, which is uh, innovations for connectivity, trust, uh, and inclusion. Um, this is part of our uh, ongoing monitoring and research on the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, this PIDS forum. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, some emerging evidence on what seems to work well in other contexts. And of course, the idea here is to try and uh, extract uh, those elements which may be useful for uh, the Philippines uh, in terms of policy making, in terms of building back better, in terms of strengthening our systems for pandemic response uh, to this pandemic, but also maybe for uh, future risks of, uh, of pandemic. So uh, one example is uh, Taiwan, for instance, which is uh, well known uh, and, uh, and uh, recognized for its near 100% uh, health insurance access. Uh, it's seen as one of the countries that have a strong response to COVID-19. And probably one of the reasons for this is because um, even prior to COVID-19, Taiwan already had a very, very strong, very, very inclusive uh, health uh, system. Uh, and so the Taiwanese have uh, strong trust and, and strong uh, inclusion uh, in this system. And uh, it allows uh, their public sector, um, it gives their public sector a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of the collective action response uh, for uh, pandemic response. The second example is Thailand, and uh, from the emerging evidence uh, on what works in this country, uh, of course, Thailand is also one of the countries that seems to have uh, done relatively well in terms of uh, containing COVID-19. 
and the, the emerging analysis is that uh, Thailand, again, also had a very strong and inclusive uh, social uh, uh, protection system and the healthcare system, but they also had a very a good track record of uh, public-private partnerships working with civil society groups, particularly uh, grassroots uh, public health activists, uh, who then were uh, instrumental in their uh, COVID-19 response. So this appears to be one of the uh, other ingredients, mm -hmm. having an inclusive uh, social insurance system and healthcare system, as well as having a long track record of public-private partnerships. Uh, Vietnam is uh, another example uh, and uh, it's noteworthy because, of course, Vietnam is um, is uh, relatively comparable to the Philippines in terms of uh, level of income and, and capability to respond to COVID-19. And uh, Vietnam seems to have fared well, despite its being very, very proximate to the source of uh, the disease, uh, which is China. Uh, and um, among the... Uh, well-noted uh, steps that uh, Vietnam took were early steps uh, in terms of response as well as uh, mobility restrictions, cutting off uh, travel ties uh, with uh, some of the countries at high risk, uh, in, in particular China, and then also uh, creating a system where of communications whereby citizens uh, have a lot of trust in the public sector and um, were voluntarily sharing personal health information in a government-launched app called the uh, NCOVI. So um, it, it uh, emphasizes that uh, Vietnam um, has a system of capturing information while still protecting uh, the rights uh, and privacy of their citizens so that this information can be used to better respond to the crisis and inform their policies in an evidence-based way so that they are much more effective. Uh, Vietnam also has, uh, has been able to tap uh, its citizens uh, in the form of collective action to provide the relevant information for crisis response, uh, in particular, very strong online messaging um, to trigger collective action by citizens uh, in support of the government's response to COVID-19. Finally, there is the example of South Korea, which is uh, seen uh, by many as one of the countries with a very strong test, trace, and treat system. And if you look back at the background of South Korea, it, it actually had relatively weak responses to MERS and SARS, which were previous um, health risks. And um, South Korea has learned uh, from these previous uh, challenges and so built um, the relevant systems in order to prepare it better for uh, the next pandemic. And, and so, of course, that uh, is the starting point for South Korea when COVID-19 broke out and it was uh, in slightly better uh, condition to manage uh, the present pandemic that we're experiencing now. So among the key elements of the South Korean response, of course, is the very strong test, trace and treat system. It has a very credible and strong mass testing system and of course uh, a contact tracing system um, that is also seen as a standard for many other countries uh, to learn from. And then it also has built into its healthcare system the capability to rapidly realign and build a surge capacity so that in case um, you have um, uh, challenges like uh, what COVID-19 suggests, COVID-19 um, will, will uh, pose uh, that the healthcare system can uh, develop the absorptive capacity to, to respond adequately. Now, since you asked about the potential constraints, I will very candidly outline uh, some of the main constraints for countries uh, like the Philippines, which may have populist tendencies. And of course, I'm alluding now to governance, uh, innovation, uh, and technology is one thing, but of course, the political, social, and economic environment uh, will shape whether these innovations, whether to what extent these innovations and technology will be effective and will actually uh, be adequately provided uh, and, and supplied. So my argument here is that uh, you have uh, an ideal, which is collective action, but 
you also have the reality for uh, many countries, uh, which is uh, populist tendencies. So uh, I'm going to juxtapose uh, one form of management against the other uh, in order to emphasize the point that it's, it's going to be a governance constraint, not a technology constraint uh, for many countries. And uh, I would posit that's the case for the Philippines. Uh, in collective action, you want an emphasis on social cohesion. Uh, in populism, you, you actually have very, very divisive uh, rhetoric, uh, which is the complete opposite. So if you wanted to build a very strong collective action response, uh, that's not necessarily what populists deliver uh, in terms of their uh, style of management. Uh, what you want in collective action, strong collective action, is expertise and evidence, uh, the science, the, the medicine, uh, medical expertise, and, and everything as far as pandemic response. But in, under populism, what you have is an anti-complexity bias, an oversimplification bias, and of course, uh, the observation by many that uh, the populism thrives in an almost post-truth world, uh, where uh, there is not necessarily a respect for expertise and evidence, uh, and almost uh, always an oversimplification of many complex issues uh, and uh, an adherence to shortcuts. Uh, in collective action, you, you want trust building for voluntary behavioral change uh, and effective uh, collective action at the individual level and at the community level. In, in populism, there tends to be a bias towards punitive and coercive approaches. Uh, not necessarily voluntary, it's, it's based on uh, punitive approaches. And uh, there is also uh, the risk of uh, high degrees of disinformation, which again is anathema to well-informed uh, individual behavioral changes uh, that could um, help produce what should be more effective collective action. So the conditions that populists thrive in and maybe even contribute to are not necessarily uh, conducive to the type of trust building for voluntary behavioral change uh, that we would like to see in effective collective action. Um, there's also this issue of respect for individual rights, which is probably what feeds into high levels of trust under ideal uh, scenarios of collective action. But under populism, what you have uh, sometimes is the use of the common good as a false justification for trampling rights. So this is unfortunate, of course. Uh, we've seen this in, in many other contexts. Um, the drug war is, is one example, but, but also in terms of um, anti-oligarch uh, sort of rhetoric uh, and, and uh, some efforts to level the playing field uh, while also eroding institutions. So uh, the, the, this is the institutions and rule of law, I should say. So th this is part of this populist style, which may not necessarily be respectful of uh, individual rights and rule of law. And finally, um, collective action is uh, based on systems-based solutions and institutional reforms to sustain uh, more effective collective action, not just uh, in the present pandemic, but maybe as a future response to other types of risks and crises, uh, including including the future risk of other types of pandemics. But uh, populism is uh, well known for the end justifies the means type of approaches and also extra legal approaches, which don't necessarily strengthen institutions. So uh, in a nutshell, th these are what I see as the governance constraints for more effectively generating uh, the innovations and technology that um, will be underpinned by trust uh, in, in a more effective collective action scenario. Uh, let me end on a more positive note on what I see are some of the key elements that uh, countries like the Philippines can build on uh, in order to facilitate a more inclusive uh, recovery from a pandemic like the one caused by COVID-19 uh, and as well as the global uh, economic slowdown. Uh, first element uh, that we're seeing from international evidence is the use of technology. So this is really the, the main theme for today's discussion. Uh, it can be for rapid testing, apps for tracking, real-time information sharing, telemedicine, but also more broadly in terms of uh, creating the platforms for inclusion uh, in the types of uh, information technology that we are now seeing as uh, useful and critical in the new normal. In fact, I would uh, propose that uh, maybe uh, 
COVID-19 will trigger uh, new national discussions on uh, access to the internet as a national public good, uh, essentially given the means uh, to access the internet and to interconnect, you will actually have a more adaptive, more resilient society uh, to these types of shocks and certainly to the shock that we are now uh, experiencing in, in the world. Uh, and, and so I think that's, that's one bucket of the first uh, uh, set of components for inclusive recovery. The second bucket has to do with trust building, uh, which you need for compliance, such as with mobility restrictions, lockdowns, with quarantine, and the willingness to share information and, and uh, the confidence to know that your uh, privacy and your rights will actually be respected, uh, even as the aggregate information becomes useful for more effective business strategy or for uh, more effective uh, policy uh, responses and collective action. So uh, you, you give up some degree of privacy for the common good. Uh, on the other hand, you balance that with some institutions, some uh, institutional innovations to protect uh, the rights of citizens. Um, and of course, uh, what this uh, tends to contribute to in terms of the environment is a strong environment of trust, social cohesion, and that is also underpinned by an environment of no discrimination. So these are the elements of an environment that populism is not necessarily well known for. Uh, and, and of course, um, that, that does suggest that um, there has to be, in order to have these types of innovations in, in types of institutions, there has to be some governance um, uh, innovation and, and, uh, and, and progress as well. And finally, uh, I would uh, suggest uh, transformation of the brick and mortar healthcare uh, system and maybe even the social protection system and maybe even the, some parts of the education system and, and other types of uh, human interaction. Um, and as you are um, transitioning to the new normal right now, uh, there could be some innovations, some reforms that will tend to stick even in a post COVID-19 world. Uh, even if we did have a vaccine at some point, and uh, some degree of normalcy were to return, maybe many of the innovations we introduced during this period will actually tend to stick uh, because of their cost effectiveness, because of their increased uh, inclusion, uh, but also because um, it makes us uh, much more resilient to future shocks. Uh, I would emphasize as a last point, this uh, issue of inclusion, which will be critical because um, as far as we see uh, the pandemic and the global economic recession that it triggered um, may have a very unequalizing effect uh, across societies, but also within societies. And so it will be critical for our policy responses, for our innovations, for our technologies to focus on uh, this element of inclusion uh, because it will be critical uh, in terms of uh, facilitating uh, much more inclusive recovery, but also the uh, right type of governance uh, that supports uh, that recovery and resilience in the longer run. Thank you very much for the chance to share these inputs uh, in today's discussions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mendoza. Uh, what you said is exactly what we want to, um, to promote here, that uh, information should be as an institution, which is the basis for governance. Um, you also mentioned that South Korea, Vietnam, and Taiwan learned from their experiences with SARS and MERS, and that's what we also hope to do in the Philippines coming from this experience with COVID pandemic, and as well as the use of technology and information, um, not just to address the public health emergency, but also to be able to improve public service delivery, um, let's say in terms of education, um, as well as for um, building trust. So. Let's go on to our final panelist for the day. She is a consultant at the Technology, Law, and Policy Program of the UT Law Center. She's a lawyer at the Decini Law Office and heads the firm's FinTech practice. She also heads the firm's legal education and policy initiatives for Philippine startups. She received her Juris Doctor degree from the UP College of Law. Her work as a lawyer focuses on FinTech, tech arrangements, data protection, and emerging media. She regularly leads regulatory transactional and corporate investment projects, and she was cited as a next generation lawyer for technology 
Media and Telecommunications from 2017 to 2019 in the Legal 500. Ladies and gentlemen, please help us welcome uh, Attorney Icon Larissa Serzo. Thank you. That's fine. That's good. Thank you. All right. Let me share it again. All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you to uh, PIDS for organizing this and for inviting me to participate uh, in this panel. So basically, uh, the context uh, behind my presentation would be uh, my experience as a consultant for the UP Law Center and as a technology lawyer uh, who's been focusing on assisting tech clients, uh, mostly startups, uh, but as well as traditional companies wanting to wanting to implement their digital transformation uh, initiatives. So the main, the main thesis of this short uh, presentation would be uh, the regulatory landscape in the Philippines and how it needs to transform to one that is able to support systems that will enable economic activity during a public crisis such as, such as COVID. So uh, as I said, we've been assisting uh, traditional companies in their di digital transformation efforts. And as a tech lawyer, it's generally an exciting space to, to, to work in due to the continuous developments in the legal landscape. Uh, however, uh, I've also been very familiar with the roadblocks which would affect tech companies. So most of the time, it's usually a matter of navigating the regular regulatory puzzle in the Philippines. Uh, although lately, the regulators have been very progressive and uh, a lot of amendments have happened and are underway in order to support greater digitization efforts. So as with most companies, uh, oh, just, to, just to share a short story on how, how, how the regulations usually look like in the Philippines. So I've, I've shared this before, but during 2015, 20, around 2015, 2016, uh, there was this one motorcycle delivery uh, and motorcycle ta taxi company that wanted to get licensed in the Philippines. And as you know, uh, usually if you want to provide delivery services and transportation services, you go to the LTFRB. Uh, however, when this company went to the LTFRB, so their motorcycle taxi, oops. Uh, yes, so could you please uh, shift to the, there you go, thank you. Uh, can you see my slide? Okay, uh, there. It's swap this place. Attorney there you go. What about that? Okay. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so when the motorcycle company went to the LTFRB, the LTFRB said that they have no jurisdiction uh, or to regulate motorcycles. So they said the company would have to go to the LGU, which regulates tricycles. But when we went to the LGU, the LG said they can only regulate three-wheeled vehicles. So, uh, in effect, there was a regulatory uh, vacuum uh, wherein no law could support the operation of motorcycle taxis. Uh, however, in the past two years, we've seen the growth of companies like Ancas as well as other delivery services, which I guess uh, shows you how public perception or how social licensing can pave the way for regulatory uh, amendments. So, so there. So that's a that's that's how our day to day usually looks like. But anyway, when the lockdown hit, similar with other companies, uh, we were worried about the possible slowdown in work activities due to the movement restrictions in place and other regulations sought to uh, control the spread of COVID. However, uh, first day of lockdown, surprisingly. Uh, we were we were uh, we received a lot of inquiries on the simplest things regarding digital transactions. So, for example, the legality of notarizing an electronically signed document, the leg uh, the legality of electronic notarization, the possibility of submitting reports and compliance documents to government agencies uh, electronically. Uh, even the legality of digitizing certain operations of a company, let's say 
signing employment documents, executing electronic contracts. So uh, surprisingly, there was actually an increase in, in our work as a technology, as technology lawyers. Uh, and I think this highlights how, how crucial certain systems are uh, when it comes to when, when there's a public crisis. So I think the COVID-19 experience of the Philippines highlights uh, the desire of, private, of the private sector and of businesses to keep on operating so and keep and to keep on closing contracts and deals so specifically they wanted to uh, like these activities were very crucial uh, the continuity of these activities were very crucial so the execution of contracts uh, cross border trading employing workers uh, making sure that you can still start a business and comply with all necessary regulations as well as uh, making sure that you can operate your education or training program in a remote way. So uh, what we've seen is uh, there's obviously a need for systems to enable to enable these. Uh, and when I say systems, this is not limited to uh, the, technolo the technological infrastructure, so like your telcos, etc. But as well as regulatory systems that would support the uh, smooth and legal operations of networks, platforms, uh, remote transactions, and borderless uh, transactions. And I think what we've seen in the Philippines compared to, or what we've seen in other countries that are uh, lacking in the Philippines is the amount of investments that private companies uh, have poured in uh, into their networks and their general uh, telco infrastructure. Uh, and I think one of the, the main thrust of this paper is that one of the hurdles really uh, for greater investments in these infrastructures would be our restrictions in the current regulation. So just to identify the important fields or the important industries that should be supported during uh, this COVID-19 crisis, I've outlined here some of them. So like online platforms, logistics, retail, telcos, and education providers. Uh, so regulations should ensure that uh, these entities can still uh, proceed with their operations. And uh, as most of you would know, uh, these industries are actually highly regulated in the Philippines. Uh, and each regulation comes with its own policy considerations. And if you're in one of these industries and you want to scale, especially in the time of mobility restrictions, uh, you need to be able to engage in borderless or remote transactions. And I'm not just talking about uh, country, country borders or national borders, but especially in the context of the Philippines, this would include uh, your natural land borders and your sea borders, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, for online platforms, just a brief overview. Uh, so all of these are actually subject to foreign equity restrictions. So online platforms, due to an interesting way of how the regulations in this space evolve, uh, is actually considered mass media and thus subject to 100% uh, foreign equity restriction, meaning only Filipinos can have or operate an online pl platform. And this actually includes entities like Facebook, YouTube, uh, etc. And then logistics and telcos, these are considered as public utilities and thus restricted to a 40% uh, foreign equity. And uh, funny, retail is actually uh, liberalized, uh, meaning foreign, foreigners can enter the space. However, uh, you need to comply with a very high amount of capitalization. So in the end, we only actually have two, one or two foreign retailers formally registered in the Philippines, and the rest have instead partnered up with local partners. Uh, same thing with education. This is also subject to a 60-40 uh, restriction, thus uh, restricting or making it difficult for foreign education and training providers to legally enter the Philippines. So now, now um, it may not be that straightforward. I mean, thinking about how uh, foreign restrictions and how they uh, impair a, an, a business's ability to scale, it may not be that straightforward. Uh, however, we have to remember that uh, other tech companies in the ASEAN have a have access to the of have access to various uh, venture capitalists and investors that want to 
uh, play in the region. So technically, by having these restrictions in place, uh, we're closing out or we're preventing our local startups from participating uh, in that space and from getting capital that would allow them to compete and scale. So what's the situation right now in the Philippines? So uh, we've noticed that the tech and network infrastructure obviously uh, is not as competitive as with other countries. And there are certain restrictions and incoherence uh, in our regulatory environment. So it's either there are outright bans, uh, there are areas where there is actually no regulation or there are overlapping regulations. However, uh, interestingly, I think, uh, and this is what we've seen, the pandemic is actually speeding up uh, the nation's capacity for reform. So we've seen that stuff that were obstacles before were not really actually uh, obstacles and that banning entire business models uh, is not workable. So for example, it's not uh, feasible for us to ban delivery services or to ban PNBS operations, and even to make it difficult for online platforms to operate. And this this has been recognized uh, or been uh, emphasized during the pandemic with government agencies partnering up with fintechs and tech companies to provide services. And during this pandemic as well, the Supreme Court approved uh, the, legal, the legality of notarizing documents remotely so that's a that's a step and several agencies such as the SEC and the DPI and the BSP uh, have allowed the electronic submission of documents as well as for the DPI they allowed electronic submission of documents uh, okay so uh, okay so I think uh, this pandemic highlights the need to rethink our existing regulatory policies when it comes to regulations affecting tech companies. So I think this, our existing regulations have largely been shaped by our colonial experience. And uh, thus, we have the need to protect our homegrown uh, entities. However, um, so, so the presumption is that uh, platforms and foreign investments are inherently malicious. But if you follow this view, actually, the, the pandemic would have been an opportune time for these tech companies and these foreign players to show their true colors. So if they're evil, it's bound to have been uh, demonstrated already. However, we see that uh, networks and tech companies have actually uh, risen, up, risen up the task. It's been critical to the continuous, uh, economic, the continuous economic activities in other countries. And uh, they haven't really, they haven't posed any uh, at least any direct and obvious harm to the general public. So it's crucial, uh, and no regulator or network provider is actually told, uh, the tech companies to be ready for a pandemic. But just naturally, they have shown that they are capable of delivering service through the crisis and even maintain quality, uh, even with increased uh, constraints. So uh, essentially, and in, in, in some, I think our COVID-19 experience in the Philippines should shape review of policy in order to encourage the increase in investments uh, from both private entities locally, as well as from foreign uh, investors uh, in order to strengthen our networks and essentially strengthen the capacity of our economy to be resilient in the event that another uh, crisis like COVID-19 happens. So there's really no one size fits all in terms of regulatory strategy. It would depend on the policy trusts of government. And uh, it's important to take a whole of government approach instead of letting each agency do their own thing, uh, which I think with the passing of the Philippine Innovation Act, a Philippine, yeah, Philippine Innovation Act from last year, uh, that law actually encourages a whole of government approach when setting policies uh, that affect uh, innovation. So, and then second, it's not really just about uh, amending regulations through a whole of government approach, but also ensuring consistency and predictability in the application of uh, regulations. So it's really system strengthening. 
And also, uh, the ability of a, there's a recognition that the ability of a regulatory agency to adapt to change and to uh, issue guidelines, etc., would also depend on the problem that they want to solve. So for static industries, they may, they may not be used to uh, being as agile. However, for dynamic industries such as, let's say, finance, uh, banking, uh, they've been dealing with change ever since the ATM uh, technology uh, cropped up like decades ago. And they're still being, uh, they're still being as agile as they were. So uh, to conclude, of course, uh, we're not saying that technology or that innovation should have a free hand. Uh, we recognize that there are dangers uh, when it comes to the regulation. Uh, however, policy considerations behind regulatory hurdles must be, reconsid must be reconsidered. And as I said, and has, as have been mentioned by the other speakers, the government can definitely take the crisis as an opportunity to push for greater reform. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Serzo, and absolutely agree that's what we want to hear about institutions and how to reform given this rare window of opportunity. So now we have only 15, actually technically around uh, 10 minutes left for the open forum, and let's just dive right into it. If we could invite the speakers to turn on your um, video and um, be ready for any questions. So the first question we have here is from Luis Bustan of the Social Housing Finance Corporation. And this is for Professor Lee. Um, we see a variety of innovative pedagog pedag pedagogical frameworks in your presentation. How could high tech, high touch factor in the direction of Philippines education sector, which promotes the use of blended learning? Professor Lee. Yes, uh, I, I, I've seen a really a very interesting uh, comments and questions in the chat box. And uh, the question you just uh, quoted is also quite uh, interesting. And uh, uh, you know that uh, after the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. many uh, educators now uh, understand uh, that the effectiveness of, of blended learning or online learning or digital learning. But I really want to emphasize that above all those new uh, pedagogies, we really have to pay attention to the great potential of AI-assisted personalized learning. Mm -hmm. So it's different from book, it's different from uh, digital classroom, it's different from computer mm -hmm aided learning, it's all not really uh, personalized. It's also not really supported by AI. So um, what I saw here is the, the great potential uh, of uh, AI in providing personalized learning experience for all. So, uh, so it's really new. Uh, even in Korea, it's really new. So that's mm -hmm. why I established Education Commission Asia uh, mm -hmm. to introduce no, new concept, uh, new uh, framework, uh, new mindset uh, mm -hmm. to embrace these new ideas. But you know that in United States, it's already been tested and and and, and utilized uh, for more than at least for five years. I have seen many mother uh, schools where they, they really embrace this AI uh, assisted personalized learning system in, in, in school schools, in, in modern schools. Uh, and I, I, I already talked about Asia State University case, right? So uh, mm -hmm. maybe, uh, if, so what I really want to say here is that this is a game changer that maybe uh, the, uh, bring about a fundamental change in the whole uh, education sector in the global community. And the issue is who will go first? Who will be, uh, who will be able to make a uh, large scale transformation? Even in the United States, after for more than five years of experimenting with this new model, I don't think it's more than 5%. Some say, uh, 
about 30% schools already uh, uh, introduced these software programs. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, introducing software programs is different from uh, combining it with uh, uh, innovative pedagogy. Right? So the uh, maybe 30% of US schools already introduced new AI assisted programs. But maybe only four, under four, under five percent schools are really uh, uh, having a uh, impact for changes uh, uh, through utilizing this new system. In Korea, it's really new. Uh, even in Korea, I mean, uh, I, I I I can say that Korea is, has been really leading the education in the traditional model. But we we our leaders and educators have been really hesitant to embrace this new model. Uh, so Korea has been uh, has been having troubles in, in embracing those changes, but COVID-19 uh, make us to realize that the, the great potential here. So now mm -hmm. government initiated a, a new program in education, embracing AI technologies, and they call mm -hmm. New Deal in education. Mm -hmm. And I really uh, want to recommend uh, Philippine government to uh, uh, really think about this uh, new uh, new opportunity. Uh, this hasn't been done in many countries, maybe including uh, uh, Philippines. This is different from MOOC, different from digital classroom, different from mm -hmm. computer aided learning. It's all not uh, really based on AI. Not, not really based on AI-assisted personalized learning. Okay, thank you, Professor Lee. There's a follow-up question, and this is somewhat related as well to um, uh, what Attorney Serzo mentioned earlier regarding the limitations for tech companies entering in the Philippines and deals with the regulations. So what were the challenges faced in Korea? Because I know that as your stint as a minister, you initiated the digitalization of books. Mm -hmm. But from there, that's been a huge leap. And then yeah. um, somewhat related is also the concern of um, developing or exacerbating social inequities because you also have a program for the poorer in in your um, in Korea, one of your uh, seminal programs there. So how do you think with this exacerbated, how can this prevent this from happening? Uh, is Professor Lee still there? Right, thank you. We see you, Professor. Yeah. So you know that. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Is yes. it okay? Okay. Okay. So uh, you know that uh, we uh, we have had a really uh, a very strong uh, regulatory system uh, mm -hmm. in education. Uh, mm -hmm. We haven't allowed uh, private companies to work with teachers uh, before pandemic. Uh, so, even in digital textbook uh, initiative that uh, I worked on as a minister, we uh, usually work with uh, public providers. We have public think tank, public institution uh, to provide uh, new uh, new technologies. But mm -hmm. I, I saw a much more innovative uh, uh, ways of uh, business and ways of services. Uh, provided by private vendors, even uh, mm -hmm. by global uh, companies. So we really have to open up the door to uh, invite them uh, to work with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Korean uh, educate, education innovators, pro, uh, uh, mm -hmm. pioneers. So what I suggested to Korean government is we really need to change the regulatory framework to allow uh, polling providers, uh, to allow private providers to uh, work with uh, educators. For example, Korean uh, schools should, uh, should provide a chance for a uh, test bed for new experiment in, in new solutions uh, uh, utilizing AI in education. So uh, uh, as uh, some already noted in this uh, uh, seminar, we really need to uh, change regulatory framework, and also we really need a data policy. Uh, there has been a lot of data, uh, but not allowed to be used in the private sector. So we really have to make uh, learning data uh, available for uh, uh, private companies. It's not been done yet, 
but we have a, a big debate uh, how we can uh, make companies, private companies, utilize those uh, learning data, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's formal or informal. There has been a lot of data created through this uh, digital learning uh, uh, practice. So uh, there is uh, there has been a lot of uh, public policy uh, uh, debates uh, mm -hmm. how to uh, uh, transform uh, this uh, learning system uh, and uh, by embracing AI technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Lee. So this next question is for Sean. Um, this is from Vic Pateo, uh, visiting fellow here at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, although I think he responded to him via chat box, but it's very timely, especially because it deals with uh, an issue raised by Professor Mendoza regarding divisiveness and how you mentioned, you and Pantea actually mentioned in the first webinar that it's, it's all over the world that there's um, divisiveness being built in social media and in messaging. So the question goes, how do you build um, how do you build trust in such environment in which political interest and acquisition of power increasingly dominate the determination of what is truthful and what is rationally compelling? So, Sean, your thoughts? Please. Yes, it, it, it's a it's a it's a very easy, short, short question to answer, which is great news for everybody. Um, I think you know one of the things, just the the short answer to this, honestly, is that. Um, whether it's objectivity in media or expertise in public health or, uh, you know, financial complexity and maximization and derivatives, um, there are a number of places where uh, complexity has taken the place of transparency. And I think that uh, a lot of these institutions, and I say this, I was trained as a journalist, I've worked in many of these fields, uh, are coming to grips with the fact that we all we all come with subjectivity that expertise varies substantially by context mm -hmm. and the value mm -hmm. of that expertise varies as well so um, from my perspective i think transparency and being explicit about one's own limitations uh, as mm -hmm. as approaches to to dialogue are are strong entry points but you know like we say in the chats you know it's it's small bits of progress uh, collected, like collectively done, as as, as described by Professor Mendoza. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So actually, I personally have a follow up question uh, regarding that. Um, you talked about data trust as a tool to build legally enforceable digital governance and rights. Now, define the harms based on impact, not procedure approach that you mentioned. What does that exactly mean? Yeah, I think a lot of so. Um, a lot of times we look at harms as uh, is, is someone, you know, is the technology inherently dangerous or is the algorithm obviously bad or wrong? Um, where our duty is not to produce typically perfect algorithms as public institutions, our duty is to provide fair and, and, and clear public services. And so, um, you know, the way that we want to frame indicators around the success of technology and the harm it can pose are in the way that people are able to or unable to access those public goods, those public services. It's not, was the technology perfect? I mean, of course, it'd be great if it was, but that's not the, that's not the underlying goal. The underlying goal is to increase learning, you know, in, in, reduce uh, disaster costs, improve and maximize efficiency in, in, in a range of ways. So uh, my, yeah, so the, the, the follow-up there is just, I think that if we keep the indicators on the outcome and the impact of these interventions and, and adapt technology in ways that drive those indicators, I think we're on a much stronger course than if we focus on technology-centric indicators. Okay, thank you, Sean. So, Professor Lee, there is another mm -hmm. question for you. Yep. Uh, this is regarding um, how can the promise of high, this is from Dr. Babes Arbeta from the PIDS. How can the promise of HDHD ed not be drowned by the concern that it may exacerbate societal inequities further? Thank you. Yeah, that's really uh, the pivotal uh, issue because you know that after the pandemic, uh, many realized that uh, education inequality has been exacerbated because there is only uh, option of online learning and 
if you really have a good online learning, uh, as I uh, keep uh, insisting, uh, AI learning should be uh, strengthened by AI-assisted personal learning system, which requires good network, good device, good uh, platform, and good content. So this whole package of, uh, of uh, uh, educational resources are required uh, for every, every student. So this really requires a big mega project for the government to focus on the, 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 the disadvantaged students. So this could be a really big challenge for all governments in the world, how to reduce the gap of online learning. I think that gap will be exacerbated enormously uh, after COVID-19. And there is no uh, any uh, effective option other than offering them with AI-assisted personalized learning opportunities. But we do have very good uh, private companies uh, able to offer good network and private companies can offer good uh, digital devices. And, and we have uh, global companies providing uh, platforms and even contents. So we really have to think about global uh, collaborative uh, mega project that really uh, could benefit uh, students in the developing countries, uh, in poor, poor families. So we really have to prioritize uh, this uh, initiative uh, focusing on uh, the underprivileged. So this, I, I emphasize that we should become a uh, really uh, primary agenda for the World Bank, ADB, and other global multilateral banks. Uh, you know that I, I. It seems like uh, we ha we are too much fragmented. We rely on too much fragmented uh, uh, the ways of assisting uh, the poor uh, people and poor country. We really have to have a focus, and we uh, now it's time to design mega project. We used to have a project called. One laptop per child. It was in 2005, right? 15 years ago, MIT uh, leader uh, suggested uh, we should make every child to have one laptop and this. Right? Now, after 15 years, or right, after uh, 15 years, uh, with all the development of AI technologies and, and, and network and so forth, why we are hesitant? to, uh, to uh, design this bold uh, global project that could really uh, address very, very important challenges that uh, the world is facing. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. That actually addresses the questions of Mr. Bandoho and Ms. Maria Isabella Granada as well. Um, I'm, we're running over time. If it's okay, we just have a couple of more questions for the speakers. Um, this one is for, um, it's from our former president, Dr. Gilbert Yanto. It's addressed to Dr. Ron Mendoza. So collective action, as we know, as a social dilemma aspect, how do you incentivize everybody to conform to these strong rules when compliance is at the cost of earning a daily living? The drivers need to ply their GPs, vendors have to be out there. The social divide is out there. The rich and middle class can more easily comply with the collective action required from everybody by government. So, Ron? Thank you, Justine and Gilbert. Yeah. Uh, and, and thank you to the speakers. I, I really learned a lot from your presentations. Um, I would have had a slightly different uh, reaction had I seen it before uh, the event. Uh, I sort of pre-recorded to avoid any technical uh, problems. But anyway, I, uh, answering Gilbert's question, I, I think really that um, while the topic is on technology, on innovations, it really speaks to institutions and the social compact. Uh, and we're talking about trust. Uh, I, I cannot imagine trust without equity, without inclusion. Why would you trust a system that wouldn't include you? Why would you comply when you don't know where your meal will come from tonight <laughs> or whether your income will be preserved tomorrow? Uh, there has to be a number of institutional innovations that together build a comprehensive pact of trust for each and every citizen and for each and every community. Without those institutions, these are little mechanisms, little technologies that don't really add up to the kind of trust that we want to see. 
and that's i think the main challenge for uh, governance and which is why i said i very much agree with sean it's it's less of a technology challenge we have oodles of technology available to us the challenge is uh, governance and uh, the institutions that generate trust and so my my answer to gilbert is you need social protection you need social safety nets you need a healthcare system that included every single filipino so that if they get sick they can go to that healthcare system and expect not to be discriminated against, not to be turned away, not to be asked whether they have enough money to pay. <laughs> it, it has to all be there. And then you can expect trust from the citizen. So I think the problem with the situation is it's much easier to resort to a punitive and coercive approach if you know that the entire system is full of holes in terms of institutions. So that is the, the I, I think that is the um, the challenge and the dividing line between countries with strong collective action response to COVID-19 and those who resort to punitive and co coercive actions because they know they're weak and divided. They resort to forceful actions instead of voluntary collective action. So thank you very much, Ron. Um, Chairman Naboro also has something to say. Um, Chairman Naboro, thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dean Ron and, uh, and, and Sean. And uh, just like Dean Ron, I learned a lot uh, too from the from the speakers. But let me just again uh, 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 raise a few. Well, just a, just a point, and I really try to center it uh, center on my presentation. That's why we have to, as a government, again, and everyone's talking about technology, the infrastructure. Uh, sorry, um, the technology and the infrastructure. But nobody's really focusing on the data, and uh, really that's why uh, uh, um, you know, and, and and to build trust. When it, when you look at the trust issues now, for example, about the issue of contact tracing here, the technology is very much advanced. If even you look at the uh, 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 the, the the contact tracing apps that are being foisted now, but it's really the data use that is really bothering the citizens, right? And uh, you know, uh, and we have always said it uh, all along that uh, as much as we issued guidelines on um, on uh, on contact tracing developers, they have been missing this point all along, right? That people will not trust their technology if they feel that they are not included, and it should it cannot uh, you know it cannot be trusted. So no matter how much the bells and whistles of technology. Uh, I mean, people would, uh, if, if the benefit to them is that clear, then they will not use that particular technology. So in, 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 in saying that again, it is now uh, for government to look at technology and to look uh, on uh, data use, you know, how we are utilizing data. As again, as I mentioned, data privacy is about maximizing the beneficial use of personal data. And so many of us are missing that point. But we just have to recognize that there are risks and uh, we have to mitigate this risk because people will not use technology and will not give their data, right, if they think that the environment cannot be trusted. Okay. So thank you, Chairman Deboro. So um, that was a very interesting discussion, very helpful. And as I said at the onset of this, at the start of this um, session, really the, the motivation was to innovate institutions. And when we talk about institutions, we talk about it in the new institutional economics concept, that institutions are really the, the rules of the game, the mandates, the regulations um, that provide the governance, which is the play of the game. And um, data and information, we also want now to be perceived as an institution and how to collect it um, share it, store it safely, and be able to use it in times of crisis is very important. So it's the rare window of opportunity right now for, for everyone in this world, um, and everybody has a role to play. That's also one thing we want to emphasize. So I'd like to, let's give a virtual round of applause um, to all of the speakers and panelists. Uh, Kisaniam Lee, uh, Sean, Professor Mendoza, Commissioner Liboro, and um, Attorney Serzo, thank you so much for for taking the time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, so virtual clap to you. Now, before we end this webinar, um, I would like to remind the audience that uh, the e-files 
will be shared here. You may download a copy of the presentations from this link shown on the screen. And you can also, uh, for WebEx participants, if you could kindly help us improve our webinars, uh, download a copy of, um, sorry, there you go. Uh, please fill up the webinar eva uh, evaluation survey form uh, on this link below. Um, please also visit BIDS to keep updated on our latest research. We have a website and social media pages on Facebook and Twitter. And we would also like to acknowledge the different agents um, oh, for that site. We have two other webinars for this particular conference. One would be on Tuesday, September 20th. We'll talk about strengthening the civil service under the new normal. And Thursday, September 24, which will talk about smart systems for agile governance under the new normal. So thank you, everybody, for those who attended and participated actively, and especially to our speakers. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you also to the agencies, officials, members of the academe, uh, legislative uh, branch, and um, all those even from other countries. We have guests from Indonesia um, and elsewhere. So thank you very much. Have a good day and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.